Hello, friends. Can you say hi, C? Hi. Hi, friends. Christian was extremely sick last week. Extremely. He wound up going into the ER. So I want to tell you the story. We'll make it a story time, but also what we did to help the baby at home after we went to the doctor and got a diagnosis and made sure that from a medical standpoint, he was okay. We were sent home to, hi, to take care of him on our own. So we'll go through that. So this way, if you have a child, and this is even for an adult, but if you have a child who you have to get the fever down on your own and you have to, you know, figure out how to stay sane and help your poor little sick Bubba while they're recovering from being sick, which is frequent, especially this time of year, then this is for quick, you. Before we get started with the story time, I just need to introduce to you this really cool toy that was sent over to us. I am so excited to introduce this Wooden Arches Indoor Climber with a slide for you guys. So first of all, it came in this enormous box with all of these different parts. It was so organized. He said it was so well made. He didn't even need his power tools, although he used them just to make it easier. My little sister has a baby a month younger than Christian, and she would totally be able to do this. So it is extremely well designed. It's an eight in one climber. It could be moved into a climber with a slide. It has a balancing board. It could be made into a seesaw, a rocking arch, a balance beam. I'm so excited for when CJ gets bigger so we can make it into a big hamster wheel type of thing. It's really pretty too because it's this natural wood. So it's really sturdy, but also it's not an eyesore in the middle of the room. I'm not a fan of those multiple color, like rainbow colored toys in the middle of my house all over the house so let's get into some of the logistics it is 23.2 inches by 23.2 by 23.2 in size and it's made of 5 8 inch thick wood and supports up to 150 pounds i climbed all on it with christian and i had no issues it didn't feel like it was bending or going to break or squeaking or creaking or anything like that so several kids can climb on it at the same time, they can stand up at the wide top without it wobbling or tipping over. It provides holistic development for your children's gross motor skills. It sparks creativity through open-ended play. It builds their self-confidence, their concentration, and it releases a lot of their energy, which us as moms, that is music to our ears. I noticed too that when we go to the park now, he's a lot more confident to climb on the rungs and the slides and, or I should say, go down the slides because he's been playing by himself here at home on this wooden climber. It's made with 100% birch plywood and professionally finished to provide years of splinter free use. It is so well made. Adam even took a moment after he finished putting it together and he was like, I am so impressed by this not only by the quality of it but the quality of the craftsmanship of it the way that the pieces fit together so perfectly he said it was not done cheaply it was not done quickly obviously they took their time they really carved this out in a wood shop and it came out beautifully it's suitable for toddlers ages one to seven years old and it's cpsia approved safe so i think that's everything you guys need to know about it I will put any links, discount codes, whatever that I get from the company in the description box below. I'd love to know if you guys got one, what you think in the comments, or if you have any questions, I can answer those for you in the comments. But with that, enjoy and back to the video. But I didn't think about this video until the other morning. So his fever broke two days ago. He's still suffering from a lot of mucus drainage out of his nose and believe it or not his eyes I thought at one point it was pink eye I know that's going around it was not but just a lot his mucus is so thick oh his mucus is so thick and just draining his face is just a little puffy his eyes actually get crusted together when he sleeps it's just it's no fun for him so here's the background story we take him to the park he was at the babysitter with other kids which I absolutely love I don't care I do care but I, it doesn't bother me, we'll say, that he's around other children and gets sick because he needs to be around other children. He needs to socialize. And he does need to build his immune system. Does it suck that my poor baby is sick? Of course. Is it heartbreaking? Of course. But it's part of life. 
it's just part of life and you have to hunker down and suck it up and go in the bathroom and cry and scream sometimes. And if you have a village, implore them. Thank God I have, I don't have a village, but I do have a very, very, very hands-on husband is just so willing to drop everything and help me, especially when I'm getting overwhelmed. I think it was Sunday or Monday with a runny nose. It was clear, just drainage. And you know, he's a baby. So he had a runny nose. He did not have any other symptoms. He did not have a fever. The only odd thing that happened was he woke up Monday morning. He was laying in bed next to me. I was working. I was answering emails from my phone. My back was to him at one point. Like literally this was split second. We had just woken up. He was in my bed and I heard him swallowing a lot. What I assume now is he was swallowing post nasal drip and all of a sudden he started to vomit. He got sick twice. It was just like mucus and bile, not even mucus. It was just like bile because he had just woken up. Adam got really freaked out, but I'm like, I th honestly think it was just, he's got post nasal drip. It's running down the back of his throat. It happens to me. We are twins. And it just made him throw up. He probably couldn't breathe or something. Just watched it. For the next few days, he just had that runny nose. No fever, no symptoms, not brown, not yellow, not green, just clear, which is normal. Not, no, I mean, obviously there's something going on with the runny nose, but it's normal color. So I didn't think too much about it. He's just, you know, maybe fighting a cold. That was on Monday was the throw up. Next few days on... <laughs> Is that your foot? On Thursday, he was just starting to act not himself, not terrible, but he was a little warm. So I took his temperature in the morning and early afternoon and it was 99. So not, not a high temperature. I didn't give him anything because that's obviously low enough that his body can, his body's fighting and I want to let it fight because there was a lot of controversy around if you should or should not use a fever reducer with a toddler, with a child or like reduce the fever or let their body fight. And I'll give you my opinion during this video. And it's just my opinion. The only thing medically I have is my degree in sports medicine slash athletic training, but I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. It's just my opinion. You do what you think is right. And also what your doctor says. Okay. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Thursday evening around 630. He is hot. Let me rewind. Like around 435, Adam and I went to the park for our workout. It was not cold. It was probably 55 degrees. So not hot, but not freezing. And there wasn't too much wind. So around 630, getting him out of the car and he's shivering and a little, starting to get a little cranky, but it wasn't crying. It was whimpering. I knew he was not okay. And when I picked him up, he was so hot to the touch and he was shivering. So we came inside, I calmed him down. And I said to Adam, we need to take his temperature took his temperature. It was 104.5. Now we took it three times. We took it three times because we use an in the ear thermometer and those aren't always, hello, those aren't always accurate. Come to find out, we learned at the hospital that night that the most accurate, unfortunately, thermometer or temperature taker, thermometer. Yeah. Way to take a temperature is rectally. I know. And I asked the nurse, I was like, but like, can I hurt him? Because now I'm an older mom. I'm in my forties. And I remember back when rectal thermometers, like from the eighties, right. And they were glass and they had mercury in them and there was risk of breaking them. And there was risk of inserting them too far. And she's like, it's not like that. She was so sweet. You guys, she was so sweet, but she said, it's not like that anymore. Like you're, you're not going to hurt him. You're not going to be able to insert it too far. They're not glass anymore. She said, you know what? I'll show you how to do it, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. So it's rectally is the most accurate. Second is under the arm and then under the tongue. And then, you know, the swipe and the ear are the least accurate. And typically they measure high. So going back to 630 on Thursday, high fever. We took his temperature three times and it registered between 104.5 and like 104.8, close to 105. So we called the urgent care and they said, you have to bring him into the emergency room immediately. Obviously that's a high, high fever and you need to try to get it down. So we packed everything up and immediately I gave him Motrin. We stripped his clothes off of him. We had him down to a diaper. Adam's like, just leave him. But I didn't want him to go into shock because my best friend told me like, you never put a baby with a high fever in a hot, in a cold, I'm sorry. You never put a baby with a high fever in a cold bath because you could put their body in shock. The temperature difference is just way too dramatic. So you put them in a lukewarm bath, but we weren't even going to the bath. Like we were rushing to the ER. And at this point he has tons of 
dark yellow drainage out of his nose and coming from his eyes. And that afternoon, I forgot this part, um, I had taken him for a walk just to get him out in the fresh air while Adam was at work. And he, and we stopped at the grocery store and he was in the stroller. So I can't see him. He's sleeping. And this woman said, Oh, he's so cute. He's out of it. He's trying to wake up. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, he's just waking up. But what I didn't realize was the mucus had dried on his eyes and he couldn't open his eye all the way. So she was like, Oh, he's kind of out of it. But his, his eyes looked crazy. So that was going on take him to the ER. And Adam said, just bring him out of the house naked, like just in his diaper. And what I did was I wrapped a thin blanket around him because again, just like the theory of taking him into a freezing cold bath, I didn't want it to be shock because at this point it's probably 48, 49 degrees. So I don't know what's right or wrong. That's just what we did. If you guys are nurses, medical moms with experience, let's all just talk about this in the comments. I'm not here for hate. Like you did this wrong. If I did it wrong, let me know but we're all just trying to learn from one another. Sometimes people can get a little aggressive in the comments like, you did that wrong, I'm unfollowing you. I'm not saying that this is scripture of what to do. I'm saying, this is my experience, this is my story, and let's all help each other. So get to the ER, they were amazing. So the ER that we did go to actually was a pediatric ER, which was great. Because he was a baby with a high, high fever, they took him almost immediately. We get to the back with the nurse and this is just kind of the check-in process. And she took his temperature and it was down to, I think like 100.1 or something low. She did say, she's like, if you do get a thermometer that is rectal, she goes, it's, it's just an under the tongue thermometer. It's the same exact thing. She goes, but just make sure that you keep them separate. She's like, I know. Cause I was like, Ugh. and she's like, I know. She's like, but think about it in the heat of the moment when the baby has a really, really high fever and you're just kind of stressed out and freaking out. You don't want to grab the wrong one. She's like, so just keep them very, very separate. Make sure it's marked. Keep them in different places. I don't even know that I'm going to get a rectal thermometer because it just, the whole situation kind of freaks me out. You know, 80s child, like just scarred, but FYI. Okay. So then we go back in the waiting room. This story is getting so long and they take us within the next five minutes. So we see the doctor. He was amazing. It was actually, I don't know if he was a resident, if he was a medical student, but we saw him first. And then he asked us a whole bunch of questions. He made the assessment. And then the other doctor, like the doctor who I guess he reports to, who he's learning from, came in. Same thing. Everybody there, you guys, was phenomenal. So they asked questions, you know, um, about the fever. Does he have a cough? Has he been lethargic? When did this start? Does he have diarrhea? Did he throw up? Is he rubbing his ears? Does What else did they ask us? They looked in his ears. They listened to his heart. The doctor was great because he was like, and this is just good for you to know, does he have any shows or anything that he likes to watch? Miss Rachel. So he's like, if you want to put that on and distract him, which helped tremendously. So just keep the phone with you. Keep a charger with you if you can. The doctor said the drainage out of the eyes. He said, I'm not concerned that it's pink eye. We've been in here for like five, 10 minutes and it would have just been draining and draining and draining with like greenish yellow pus. His eyes aren't red. They're not very swollen to me. He's like, what happens is this is viral. He said, and there's tons of viruses that babies can get. He said, but the virus makes mucus and it drains. So sometimes with babies, like the tubes aren't all the way developed yet. It's draining out of any way that it can drain out. He lifted up his shirt and he looked at his stomach and his breathing. They also did a very, very, very thorough search, search, <laughs> check of his body for a rash. They asked me if there was a rash, checked his hands, checked his feet, checked his diaper area. I do know it was probably for Coxsackie, which is also hand, foot, and hand, foot, and mouth disease, where they get a very high fever rash, typically on the hands, the feet, inside the mouth. It could be anywhere on the body, but those are the typical Coxsackie, like hand, foot, and mouth. That's why it's called spots. So he didn't have a rash at that point we'll get there but the doctor said his breathing is okay what you want to check for just in case of like rsv anything like that but my baby did not have a cough at that point you see his belly's you know breathing in and out naturally if it's like you know really really fast or if he's skipping breaths or if the lips are turning blue or if like the, the um chest part where he's breathing is like sucking in i think that's what it is i don't know you guys correct me in the comments but that's when you need to get them checked the doctor comes in, he checks his ears, he checks his stomach, he checks his breathing, da, da 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 And he said, you know, he told me that you were concerned about his breathing. He said, what happens is when the fever is spiking, typically they're, they're getting an adrenaline rush and that does affect their breathing. And you're going to notice like quick 
breathing and it's going to be shallow and the belly's going to go in and out. He said, but once, you know, you could get the fever to kind of break, go back down with medication, whatever you're using at that point, the breathing should even out. He said with him, it's settled. You know, I've been talking to you for a few minutes. You could see that his breathing's better, which it was. He said in instances where it doesn't calm itself down after five, 10 minutes and you can't get it to go back to normal, that's when you want to get concerned. He said it was viral. I asked him, I said, is there anything I can do for this mucus to help dry him out? Is there anything like natural child approved that dries out the mucus? And he's like, really? No. He said, you know, with allergies, you could use a decongestant. You could use something for allergies. That'll get it down. He said, but with the virus, the virus is, that's, this is a side effect of the virus and it needs to drain out. I get it. Fine. Looked in his ears again and he went back and forth twice. And he's like, this ear looks a little, mm, like it's, it looks, excuse me. It looks different. He said, so I'm going to prescribe you amoxicillin and he should be good in a couple of days. Now, thank God I had said to Adam right before the like, crazy, how things just like fall into place before he even spiked this fever, just in the afternoon. I'm like, isn't it amazing? My nephew has not been on antibiotics his whole entire life until this last December. And he's seven and a half years old. And he was like, yeah, I'm like, if we could do that for CJ, that would be amazing. Because, you know, if they, obviously if he needs it, I'm going to give it to him. But if it's not necessary and his body can fight itself as me, that's my opinion. You do what you want to do under the guidance of your doctor. Disclaimer. Okay. This is my opinion. This is not advice. This is what I did. My opinion under the guidance of the doctor. Okay. So Adam asked, thank God I had said that right before we went to the, we had this whole situation with his fever, had to go to the hospital. So Adam said, do we have to give him the antibiotic? Is it necessary? And the doctor said, no. He said 90% of ear infections are viral. 90% of conjunctivitis is viral. This is coming out of the doctor's mouth. You do your own research, talk to your own doctor. This is what came out of my doctor's mouth. He said, with the fever spiking that high, I will write a script just so like your fever's not going to be that high for so long. He said, but you can absolutely go home, use fever reducer for the next four, maybe five days. And if the fever remains that high, then you want to consider going on the antibiotic. Let the body try to fight, do its thing. He said, or if you start noticing drainage out of the, this ear, it was CJ's right ear, then you want to start the antibiotic. Adam was like, awesome. He said, I'll, I'll give you the script to take. He said, and then you guys decide, but I am totally fine with you trying to let the body fight itself. It should be good. He should be okay within four or five days. Keep, keep him comfortable. He said, you can alternate between Tylenol and Motrin. He said every three hours. I chose not to do every three hours. We were able to go five to six hours, depending on the day, but that's what he told us. Thankfully, we were in and out. We were home by 8.30 and it proceeded to be a difficult next four days. So this was Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the baby was, <laughs> we just went like fever back and forth between the fever reducers when the fever would spike. <laughs> Should I just leave it like this and keep going? Cause it's kind of cute. <laughs> oh, who's that guy? I'm glad he's doing that. Cause you can see his nose is crusty and his eyes are still kind of a little puffy and swollen. So we would have to wake up in the middle of the night because he would wake up crying because he couldn't breathe out of his nose. So we would have to get up, use saline and the snot sucker. Those were my two, okay, my saviors all during this time was baby saline. A doctor suggested using the snot sucker. He actually recommended the Freedom Mom, which we have. I will link it below. It is a lifesaver. Use whatever snot sucker you prefer, but if you don't have one or if you've never tried this one, it's wonderful. And I'm telling you the amount of mucus that we sucked out of this child's nose, I don't understand. Now, it, like, it makes sense why it was coming out of his eyes. So Sunday night, we're going back and forth between a fever reducer. It's not great. So we put him in the stroller, CJ in the stroller. It was an unseasonably warm day. It was like high 60s. And we were just going to go for a nice long walk. But about halfway through the walk, I would say maybe like half an hour in, CJ took a turn. He just got really cranky. You could see in his face, like his face just went sick again. So we hurried home and we had to do the fever reducer. We had to actually strip all his clothes off, open the window. At this point, it's like nighttime. So um, it was getting cool out, open the window. We actually took um, a cold 
washcloth, took a washcloth, ran it under cold water and put it under his arm. He hated it, but it's armpit and groin, we learned, that will uh, get the fever down. Also took his diaper off. And I just laid a towel on me. And at this point, Adam's like, what do you think about the antibiotic? I said, I was thinking the same thing because now here we are Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We're on the fourth day. Fourth ish. Because I guess it's Friday. The I don't know. Whatever. And um, it's probably time. At this point, it's six. I'm sorry. It's 540. Adam calls the pharmacy down the street and they're like, yes, we have the amoxicillin. We have the amount that you need. Hurry up and come in. We'll wait for you. We're closing at six. When he comes home, the baby's asleep and his fever's down. So I'm like, what do we do? Do we wake him up and give him the antibiotic? Hold off. And he's like, let's hold off. He's already sleeping. The fever's down. CJ slept until eight o'clock in the morning, woke up, and he was much better. Thankfully, he did not have a fever. He did have the congestion, but thank God my sister called and she was the one that woke up CJ and I. Adam was already gone at work. She was like, oh, poor guy looks miserable. She FaceTimed. She's like, poor guy looks miserable. She said, listen, she was like, just so you know, Emma, her daughter had almost the exact same symptoms a couple of months ago. If he breaks his fever and then you find a rash, she's like, don't be concerned. She's like, the rash is typically after the fever. That's when they are not contagious anymore. And it's just, she's like, the fever is the side effect of whatever virus this is. And the rash comes at the end of it. Thank God she told me that. Otherwise I would have freaked that my son had like measles or something. So that whole day, I did not have to give him any other fever reducer. His fever was down to 100, 101 throughout the day. And that's where, you know, with the whole fever reducer, yes or no thing, I decided to let his body fight because it was low enough. So in my opinion, if the fever is so high that it's going to potentially cause harm to his brain, a seizure, something like that. 104, 105, like to me, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, speak to your doctor, make your own opinion, but in my opinion, I will use a fever reducer. But here's the debate. This is what some people say. The fever is the body fighting the germs. It's making a hot environment so the virus can't replicate and spread as quickly, let nature do its thing. But then the other camp says, that's also his body fighting too hard reduce the fever so he's not trying to fight the fever and he can actually fight the germs in my opinion this is not medical again talk to your doctor do your own research i cannot reiterate enough those points because i'm, I'm not a doctor but in my opinion from my logic from what my doctor said is I will reduce the fever when it's very, very high because I don't want negative side effects. When it's low enough that it could be his body fighting itself, then I will let it fight. So 101 final day, still has a lot of drainage, still waking up in the middle of the night, not 100% himself, but getting better. We didn't start the antibiotic because we didn't need it. That day around like five o'clock at night, at that point, it's like 98, 99, his temperature. And he got a rash on his chest up on his face and on his back and his arms and his legs. And I told Adam, I'm like, thank God Elena called me this morning. Thank God she told me about that about the rash. I took a picture, I sent it to her. Thank God she was up at midnight on the East Coast. And she's like, yes, that's exactly what Emma's looked like. And it was gone within the day. The doctors at the hospital didn't test him for anything. Not COVID, not flu, not strep, nothing. They just said there's a lot of viruses going around right now. He's, he's tired and he wants to nurse. So we're gonna do that in a second. I guess my takeaways to you, 30 minutes later, are number one, lots and lots and lots of rest. Most of the time, the baby was literally for three days, I was under a child. He would not sleep during the day unless he was touching me, on me, laying on me. Even those times in the stroller, we tried two walks when he was feeling better and he kind of crashed. I think he needed to sleep, but he also needed mama. So I don't know how you feel about that. Do your thing. But for me, I had no problem letting him sleep on me as much as he needed to. Number two for my baby, because he's still nursing, he was nursing a lot of the time. Also, the doctor said it is okay if he doesn't want to eat but he does need to drink. You need to make sure that he has fluids. The weight that he loses from not eating will come back. Dehydration is an issue and it'll wind you back up here, right back here in the ER. This virus, he was asking actually for his bottle because for me with nursing with CJ, I don't necessarily think he's getting a ton of milk from me. I just don't make a lot of milk. I don't leak or anything like that. I don't pump a lot of milk. I stopped pumping months ago just because it was kind of um, causing like 
emotional issues for me because nothing was coming out. I would get like half an ounce after 40 minutes from each side. So the point is, I think he's nursing more for comfort than hydration, but he was asking me for bottles. He was doing well. He wanted to drink water out of a straw for some reason. And he wasn't drinking much because he wasn't able to breathe much out of his nose. So what I would do was we would suck his nose, you know, using the snot sucker and then try to offer him drinks then. He wasn't drinking as much as normal, but he was drinking. And then the times where he just didn't want water or anything, when I was at the urgent care when he had the flu, they gave me an extra syringe that they use to syringe medicine into their mouths. And we save it and we disinfect it and we use it to syringe water into his mouth when he doesn't want to drink. So this way, at least he's getting some hydration. So those were those tips. So hydration, 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 that's probably number one. And then if you choose to do the fever reducers, which we did because his fever was so high, it was, you can alternate between Motrin and Tylenol. We actually went and we got different Tylenol than what I got originally because the one that I had was infant's Tylenol with dye in it. And I try to use dye free personal preference. I just don't want him to have those dyes if I can avoid it, if that's all I can find on the shelf. And that's why I had it in the house. That's all they had when he had his tongue tie done. Then of course I, you know, I prefer to reduce the 105 fever over worrying about the dye in that instance. My doctor told me you could do it every three hours. I waited because he was okay for like five five, six, sometimes seven. I don't know if I ever made it seven, but five, six hours was when we would alternate. For me personally, and my sister said the same thing, the Motrin seems to work better. So in in my opinion, the Tylenol works faster, not as well, and it wears off faster. The Motrin takes a little bit longer to kick in. So you're going to have to worry about your fever reducing techniques if the fever is really high, not too much longer. I would say the Tylenol is like 30 to 45 minutes. The Motrin, I would say is 45 to an hour, but once it's kicked in, it lasts longer. And I find that he is a little bit, his symptoms are a little bit more subdued on the Motrin. You choose to do you. There were times where when it was at its worst, which was, I think the third day where we just went and alternated just to make sure he was on something. Okay. So the, the fever reducers, hydration, fever reducers, mama time. I let him sleep as much as he needed to sleep. It wasn't affecting his sleep at night. He was up at night anyway, cause he couldn't breathe. Lots of rest, you know, just lots of extra love. We did a lot of Miss Rachel, whatever we could do to keep him as comfortable as possible. Thank God my sister told me this one too, cause it was a miracle. I wasn't doing a ton of baths, but like by day two or three, he was starting to get like stinky. And he did have a couple of blowout diapers, I'm assuming from the Motrin. My sister suggested, she's like, when the fever's really high, you might not want to give him a bath because she found that after the baby had a high fever, after even a lukewarm bath, which helped her in the moment, but afterwards the fever would spike again. And I didn't want to do that with 100, 405. But by day three, again, he was like dirty, stinky blowout diaper. He needed to be cleaned. I did take him in the bath, lukewarm. He enjoyed it. His fever was up because it was that night. It did not go any higher than it already was. But she suggested, she's like, if you don't want to put him in the bath, what I did was I ran the steam. Like I ran the shower really hot. She put a towel under the door, let the bathroom get really steamy. And it runs a lot of that out of their nose and it'll help the eye, which I did. We were in there for 15, 20 minutes. Blessing from God. It was a day that Miss Rachel released a brand new episode. Can you tell we're fans? She released a brand new episode. So he was really into it. I was letting him watch it on my phone. And we just stayed in there. Mama got a facial. Can you tell? Just kidding. The steam in the bathroom. So those were our tips and tricks. In the moment, it was torture. To see your baby in that much pain is torture. But I'm also in in my uneducated, not professional, just a mom trying to figure it out with a little bit of information and some logic. I'm grateful in my opinion that I did not use the antibiotic because then on the other end of it, I would have had to fight really hard to get his gut microbiome back going. I've been doing a lot of research on that recently. If you need an antibiotic, use the antibiotic, please. Please use the antibiotic. Am I against it? Absolutely not. If we filled it, I was going to use it. But I tried to let his body fight naturally as long as I could. And it wound up, thankfully, he didn't need it. My baby's gut microbiome is already very sensitive because of the issues that I had with Miralax and constipation and everything that stripped the gut lining that was giving him like weird ticks and sort of Tourette-esque type of 
reactions to it. I will link the video up there on the cards. It's freaking petrifying. So I worked to get his microbiome back. But moral of the story, his body fought it off. We are good here. Hopefully you got some tips and tricks out of this. And you know what, you guys? Housework and vacuuming and dishes and elaborate dinners can wait while the baby's sick. We did take out one night. We did real simple like protein shakes one night. I am so, so, so blessed for so many reasons that I have the husband that I have. But one of the many incredible reasons is that he's such a hands-on dad. So my heart breaks. Like the first thing I thought about was my sister who's a single mom and her daughter's a couple months younger than CJ. I'm like, I would have hopped on a flight to help her if she didn't have anybody to help. My heart is with all these single mamas, especially single mamas that don't have a village because I don't have a village, but I do have a great hands-on husband. Okay. I love you guys so much. This is whew, a tangent and I'll see you in the next one. Mwah.